Our next speaker is an American psychopharmacologist and a professor of neuroscience, psychiatry, and behavioral science at the Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He has done groundbreaking research on psilocybin since it became legal again for researchers to study. Please welcome Dr. Roland Griffiths. Well, I'm, I'm so pleased to be able to join you today to tell you about the work we've been doing at Johns Hopkins with psilocybin, which is a naturally occurring uh, substance that is native to the psilocybe mushroom, the so-called hallucinogenic or magic mushroom. And we now at Johns Hopkins have been studying psilocybin for 20 years, uh, initially just very interested in the acute uh, and persisting effects of psilocybin. And then we have uh, pers pursued a series of studies in patient populations looking at therapeutic applications. But in a nutshell, our initial observation made 20 years ago was that when psilocybin is administered to carefully screened and prepared individuals, these were healthy volunteers, under highly supported uh, conditions, uh, people have experiences over the course of the six or eight hour session that they consider to be among the most personally meaningful and spiritually significant experiences of their entire lives. And as a clinical pharmacologist, having studied uh, dozens and dozens of psychoactive drugs, uh, that got my attention very strongly. And one of the very interesting features of this experience that's so highly valued is that it maps on to naturally occurring mystical type or transformative type experiences that have been reported by mystics and religious figures throughout the ages. So there's something about these experiences that's incredibly compelling and the, and the features of this experience and which may be familiar to a number of you who have meditation or other kinds of spiritual practices. The features of this experience is this sense that we're all interconnected. There's a, a larger unity. There's something precious about this experience. Some people use the word sacred or, or in, in indeed uh, evoking deep reverence. And then there's something absolutely true about these experiences. They, they hold an authenticity uh, that's incredibly compelling. And so, so in, a, in, a, in a very quick summary, these experiences are one of the interconnectedness of all people. We're all in this together. Uh, it's precious and it's true. And, and when that comes together, that accounts for why people value these experiences enduringly. Now, the interesting piece of this and why they've become therapeutically relevant is that people attribute uh, very positive long-term changes in attitudes, moods, and behavior to such experiences. And so, of course, because we're deeply interested in the human condition and reduction of human suffering, we've been very interested in adapting the administration of these psychedelics to patient populations. And our initial study with patient populations focused on uh, cancer patients who were anxious or depressed, secondary to a life-threatening cancer diagnosis. And this was a randomized crossover, highly controlled, tightly controlled study. And what that study showed is a single high dose of psilocybin produced marked decreases in depression and anxiety immediately after psilocybin administration that endured out to uh, our follow-up point was six months. Now, remarkably, a group from NYU ran a very similar kind of study and they just recently completed a four and a half year follow-up and they're showing the same thing. So if you just think about that for a second, it's really quite remarkable that a single discrete intervention produced in this case, drastic changes in anxiety and depression lasting out to five years. And anecdotally, we hear that all the time 
from other uh, patients. So other populations, so that's one population is palliative care, end of life care. And we think that's really important and compelling. Uh, but we have also worked with major depressive disorder and shown that uh, uh, two sessions of psilocybin, and it's possible that we would get it with one, but two sessions produce marked decreases in depression symptomatology among people with major depressive disorder who are, who are very significantly uh, depressed. And, um, and that occurs in most people, not all people who are treated, uh, but it's, it's vastly different than the drugs that we have available right now to treat depression. In fact, there are two companies that have gotten uh, approval to move forward with clinical trials uh, from the FDA that if those trials are positive, then we can expect psilocybin to be approved for either treatment resistant depression or major depressive disorder. And that's gonna occur in the next uh, four to six years, I might, would be my guess. But that's not all. There are other really interesting applications. So we're working in the addictions and other people are. We have shown remarkable effects in treatment of cigarette smoking, where we've taken people who have tried to quit numerous times and failed to quit smoking. And after, in this case, uh, a single session, or in some cases, a couple of sessions, uh, their uh, cigarette smoking decreases. And our first study showed 80% abstinence rates at six months, which is just unheard of in, uh, in the addiction field with uh, cigarette smoking. And there are other centers now that are working on alcoholism and cocaine addiction. Other targets uh, include uh, anorexia nervosa. We're looking at depression in early onset uh, Alzheimer's disease. We're going to initiate a study in PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, we're looking at depression associated with alcoholism, depression associated with uh, Lyme disease uh, syndrome. So there are a variety of potential targets. One thing that I should say is that these compounds, this intervention is so interesting because it appears to have cross-diagnostic generality. So that's unlike anything we have in psychiatry pharmacotherapy right now. We normally treat a condition like depression with an SSRI, which is targeted selectively at, you know, at the serotonin system. Or we treat uh, opiate addiction, for instance, with an opiate agonist. But here we have an intervention that cuts across a variety of therapeutic conditions. Now you can ask why, <laughs> and it's a great question, and I wish we knew more about it. We actually know uh, that the basic science is unfolding very rapidly. So we actually know where in brain these compounds act, what centers in brain are activated and deactivated when people have taken psilocybin. We know something about brain network connectivity uh, that occurs uh, when uh, people have taken uh, these drugs. Um, but we're, we're, we're still at our infancy in terms of really understanding these mechanisms. But, but there is a, a signature about these uh, effects, and that is, relates to this so-called mystical uh, experience. And that is um, that people do experience this profound transformation in sense of self and worldview that can be hugely empowering to them going forward. And although there are some people who are interested in developing non-psychedelic psychedelics, <laughs> uh, we, we think a lot of the function of the value of these compounds resides in this experience of the transformative and mystical. And with that comes the ability for people to essentially reauthor their own life narrative. And I think that's very, very important. So it's exciting. I'm delighted to be here and to share these findings with you.